conversion rate optimization with video. Um, I'm sure many of you know, and possibly from your own experience, that video can massively help to increase conversion rates. And if you go online and you search around, you'll find tons of, oh, hello, tons of data that, that just proves this. So, you know, the video, having a product video on a page is about six, 64 to 85 percent more likely to result in a conversion or that actually just having a video on the landing page is going to increase conversions by 130%. Uh, or possibly the proof, cast iron, that 46% increase in conversion rate just by having video at all. Um, so, you know, obviously I had a look at this with some trepidation and skepticism, as you might hope. But I wanted to check how um, video was really helping uh, Wistia's website. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Wistia is a video hosting and, and analytics platform. Uh, basically, it's kind of like YouTube, but it's just for businesses, and you, um, you can get a lot more granular data and, uh, and tools to help use your marketing. Um, so we obviously have a ton of video around our website. It's a video-based product, so um, we use that. And I wanted to see how it helped conversions, and this is what I found. That actually, we see quite a significant uh, higher conversion rate for users that are watching videos than those that aren't. So um, this is obviously really compelling data for us, and I thought, well, maybe we should try putting videos in places that we hadn't. And one of the most obvious places to try putting a video that for some reason we'd never really bothered with was our main product page. So we went and created a video for the main product page that uh, was this piece here. Um, and what it did was just basically show you uh, what the different main features and value propositions of the product are, how it all works, and try to convince you to potentially buy the product. And we launched it uh, in May last year, and this is what we saw. Oops. So conversion rate just tanked, and we started to lose uh, you know, quite a bit of business off the back of this. So this felt very counterintuitive that somehow, despite all the data, all the uh, hyperbole, and the data from Google Analytics ourselves telling us that video would really help us increase conversion rates, why in this instance did it fail to do so? Um, so in fact, we, we put up a second test um, for this one on the right. Uh, so just a normal static kind of little carousel thing there. Um, and this actually gave us a 9% increase in signups, so recovered all of the different problems that we had. Um, but gave us pretty clear evidence when we got to statistical significance that in this particular instance, video really wasn't helping us. And so I think really the point here is that you need to know how to use video effectively and strategically to get a result. It's not enough, like most uh, articles you read on the web suggest, just to do video, and video itself is the reason why you will be getting great results. Uh, that's not true at all. And of course, as we all know as uh, optimizers, you need to be split testing everything and make sure it works for you. Just because it works for a great number of other people does not mean it's going to work in your instance. And so I think there is basically four kinds of things that you need to be split testing with video specifically. Um, firstly, as I went through, video versus non-video. Is actually having a video on this page beneficial for you at all? Uh, secondly, the placement and display. So where the video is on the page, how big... Uh, the embedded video is, what it looks like, what the thumbnail is like, etc. Uh, three, the video content. So actually testing different variations of content and seeing which one has a, a better benefit for you. And then lastly, what I'm calling in-stream actions. So this is basically trying to get people to do something while watching the video, possibly enter an email, click on a link, all that kind of thing. Um, and so today I'm going to just go through all four of these things. Uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of data that I've pulled out to show general trends that we found at Wistia. Um, from just under 10 million videos that we have uh, from different customers using our platform. Uh, and so we've got about, I think, 50,000 active customers at the moment, about 10 million videos together. I crawled all the landing pages, I pulled all the data, and uh, some of this that you're going to see today has never been shown elsewhere. So I hope that you find it interesting and useful. Uh, I'm going to start with looking at video versus non-video. And so there's a few trends that we found um, when looking at various different um, websites, looking at our own website, looking at some of our key customers, about the types of video that best help increase conversion versus, versus those that aren't working. And here's some of the, the uh, evidence and, and anecdotal suggestions that we found. So here's the types of videos that help increase conversion the best, as a rule of thumb. Uh, typically, things like teaching videos. So what I mean by teaching videos is basically a tutorial, something educational, maybe a webinar, maybe a conference video, something that is explaining to your customers or your audience uh, how to engage in a specific action and, and do something that they are looking to solve, so a problem that they're looking to solve. Uh, secondly, a live action explainer video. So what a live action explainer video is is basically uh, 
the faces of actual human people explaining how to use a product or service. This is true even for software products. So using things like a screencast, it's much better to actually film somebody watching a screen and, and actually engaging with the product rather than just having a flat 2D screencast. Um, so the more kind of personality and the more dynamism you can inject in these kind of videos, typically they tend to, to convert better. Uh, and lastly, a personalized sales message. So what I mean by this is basically, um, if you are working probably in a SaaS space or with a high value product, you might have a sales team. And one of the best ways we've found that video helps conversion in this instance is making an individual sales video, usually just with a webcam or a cheap camera, sending that to the specific prospect, uh, creating a personalized message for them. So I might say, you know, hey, Pep, I saw you were on our website and you put your email address in, would love to chat. And just sending a video that really connects in a slightly more personal way than would a generic email or a phone call or that kind of thing. So we're finding that really helps to convert and, uh, and I'd recommend testing that kind of stuff out as well. On the other side, there are some types of videos that many companies are creating regularly that we've noticed don't tend to help quite as much. And the first one of these, which I think is the biggest uh, problem, is the culture video. So when companies are first starting out with video, many of them try to go down this route and say, well, we don't want to try anything that's too hard. We don't want to try anything that's going to be too uh, product focused. We just want to do something kind of fun that shows who we are as a business. And that's absolutely fine but they don't really tend to help with conversion very much because these will often live on things like About Us pages or on YouTube channels, and they'll just kind of give an overview of the, the culture of the business, which is all very well and good if you're trying to attract you know, new employees, that kind of stuff, but doesn't really help you when it comes to getting more people in the funnel to convert for more money. Um, the second one that we found has a bunch of problems is the animated explainer video. So this is kind of like the live action explainer video, but everybody just goes out and makes these incredibly generic, you, you know, if you go and um, there's, t I'm not going to mention any, but there's tons of these platforms out there where you can pl pay just a couple hundred dollars and they'll make you this generic video that goes, hey, did you know why you have this problem and our product will solve it for you? Um, because these are so impersonal and incredibly generic in instances, they don't tend to help because they don't enable that trust in your product or really sell your individual value proposition very well. So well, the stuff that Amy was talking about yesterday about the, the kind of differentiation and making it about your customer, these don't help do that. So we've noticed that doesn't help so much. Uh, and lastly, customer testimonial video. Now, this may sound really counterintuitive, um, but I think the reason why these don't tend to work that well um, is because they just feel too staged. So there's kind of two ways you can approach a customer testimonial video. You either just get your customer on a camera and just say, say great things about a product, in which case it always just feels a bit stilted and kind of not particularly high quality, or you go the other way and you kind of script it really heavily and you get the customer to sort of, um, you know, get loads of B-roll in their office and get them to sort of say nice things about you. And again, this is problematic because it feels too staged. So actually finding a way to get the customer to do a good quality video that doesn't feel staged is extremely hard to, to actually match up there. And so a more personalized sales message we, we see tends to work better at that lower in, uh, conversion stage in the funnel. A uh, couple of quick notes about uh, video for conversion optimization. Don't be using these platforms for video on your site. Now, most companies in the world do use videos like this on the website because they're free, um, and it's just the default platform that we think of. But the problem is, is that you just don't get the data or the uh, information or the tools that you really need to do effective CRO or indeed any sort of effective measurement. And so for videos on your website, I'd recommend using a platform on the left. Um, obviously, I work for Wistia, so I'd love for you to use us. But uh, in the interest of fairness, Video and Brightcove also offer a good service. Um, and then obviously for the social videos on the right, these are great platforms, but you should use them uh, in addition to the on-site video platforms for you know, any social media marketing that you're doing rather than just putting all of your videos on YouTube and, and syndicating that everywhere. And the reason for this is mostly about data. So if you're using one of these uh, on-site video hosting platforms, you can do user-based tracking, you can see exactly who's been watching which video, you can then tie this to your CRM or your marketing automation platform, and then really tie up all of the data um, in terms of uh, user behavior into a funnel and actually get some really granular actionable data about where video is helping convert certain customers. And then you can start to show ROI. And so if you're working with any companies that are really chasing the numbers, this is a great way to go in and be able to say to them, well, we know that you spent 10 grand on this video, but it helped convert these three customers that then started you know, giving you 50 grand a year. Then they're able to really see that there's clear ROI in that sense. Um, for anyone who wants to quickly uh, go and check and see what's going on with their own videos, check out this blog post that I wrote a couple of weeks ago. Um, in here is just some like custom segments that you can plug in, a free Google Analytics dashboard as well that you can plug into your GA, and just start seeing how your overall videos are um, helping to uh, increase conversions and, and provide value for your particular websites. 
So that's kind of you know, testing video versus non-video in a kind of broad sense. But what about if we've worked out that video is going to be a value for us, um, and we now need to look at how we can actually place video in the space to get the most value from it. Uh, so I crawled 80,000 pages uh, a few weeks ago um, and wanted to basically check where the videos were placed uh, on the page. So you know, picked just kind of 80K that looked like they were getting quite a bit of traffic. Um, and then segmented it into zones like this, where each zone was about 250 pixels uh, in height. So we're kind of looking at this in a sort of above and below the fold sense, but a bit more granular than that. And here is what we found. The play rate uh, basically tends to trickle down in a fairly linear fashion there. Um, obviously, it drops significantly after zone four. That's kind of where the fold is. So what you basically can see here is that as a, as a general rule, um, the higher a video up is on the page, the more likely it is to be played uh, across the board. So if you've got a video right at the top, you're going to get a 56% play rate on average, which is, which is clearly quite high. Um, we then also wanted to look at video, uh, the way the videos are embedded on the page. So obviously, you have a choice in terms of your design, whether you want to embed small little frames, great big frames, uh, huge full screen videos. Um, and I wanted to see kind of what the play rate was for videos of different sizes. And what I found here was that actually, if you look at um, videos that are about 400 to 600 pixels wide, uh, that tends to be the little sweet spot there where you get the highest play rate. And I think that's because this particular size is roughly what you see on like a normal YouTube page or a Vimeo page. So this is the kind of size of video player that we're used to experiencing when we are um, you know, generally browsing on the web and, and consuming video content. Interesting to note, however, that at the top there on the right, when you get to really, really big videos, so bigger than 1,200 pixels, again, there it kind of just ticks up a bit. So either go for that sweet spot of about 400, 600 pixels, uh, or, that, um, or test you know, really, really big videos, but make sure that you're not going down to these really, really small videos. I see a lot of uh, e-commerce websites where they'll just you know, shove tiny little videos almost as another product image in a carousel. Um, those don't tend to get played quite as much as, as the bigger ones. Uh, so then play rate by video length. Now this is really interesting, I think. So we wanted to basically, I, I looked through all the, the 10 million videos we've got and looked at the average play rate. Um, what you see here is that actually videos over five minutes get dramatically higher play rates on average than other videos uh, altogether. Um, and I think this is basically because you know, if you're doing a massive over five minute video, you're probably gonna place it front and center. So this may not be causal, it may be just uh, you know, correlation is not causation, all that. Um, however, really interesting to see there that Really, really long videos tend to get a much higher play rate than, than shorter ones. Um, and if you're creating something that's around you know, a minute or two, that seems to be getting the lowest play rate there. So either create a short, punchy video that's maybe a minute or less, or go really, really big on the other end and do something long form like this. But what about the way in which videos are presented on a page? Um, so obviously, in, in the Wistia product, you can adjust the color of your player to match your brand. Um, and I wanted to see, for companies that have done this, how has this affected their play rate? And we found that actually you get a 19% average increase in play rate if you just customize the color of the player. Uh, and seemingly, anecdotally, this is best when it kind of matches the overall design and feel of your website, which I think tends to make sense intuitively because you can imagine uh, you know, why that data, why um, that experience is gonna be better for users. But I think something more interesting happens when we then look at how thumbnails behave as well. So um, this is from Moz Whiteboard Friday. I'm sure many of you have seen Moz Whiteboard Friday before. Uh, on the left is an old video. Um, so this is uh, Marshall Simmons and Rand Fishkin just kind of doing a, a general talk. And the thumbnail there is just a frame from the video itself. It's just you know, the automatic one that's selected when they upload the video. Whereas the one on the right, this is not a screenshot from the video itself. This is actually just an image that uh, the designer built in Photoshop uh, separately to try and you know, create an engaging thumbnail that was gonna be clickable. And what we've generally noticed uh, across the board, this is not just Moz, but data from all our customers, is that you get a 35% increase in play rate if you have a custom thumbnail. And so the strategy, the, the tactic here to apply, I think, is really to think of your thumbnails like movie posters. We've got into this kind of habit, I think because of the way in which YouTube has taught us to behave, of thinking of thumbnails as having to be a screenshot from the video itself. But actually, there's no reason why that need be the case. And I think if you just think about creating a uh, specific image for that particular video, so think of it like a movie poster, um, just something that looks engaging is going to attract clicks, preferably with a human face, you're going to get a much, much higher uh, play rate on the video and hopefully get more customers engaged that way. Cool. So uh, that is uh, the positioning and the display. But what about the actual video content itself? 
so obviously, if we're going to invest a lot of time and money in video, we want to make sure it's working. And so we might want to split, split test different variations of the video. And so if, if you're using Optimizely, very, very easy to do this. Um, and I think the best sort of metric to measure the overall impact of that specific video is probably engagement. And so engagement basically is how many people keep watching your video to the end versus how many uh, drop off. Now, the average engagement across all Wistia videos is about 49.6%, so just under 50% average engagement. So that gives you a reasonable benchmark in which to judge your own performance. If you're seeing most of your videos drop kind of 20%, that's probably they're not very good. And if you're seeing 70 80%, that's really, really strong performance in terms of overall engagement. But actually, the more effective and interesting way to break this down, I think, is by different parts of the video. So there's three different parts of the video which I recommend looking at. The nose, so this first kind of 5%, the body, the kind of middle 90%, and then the tail, the end as well. And what you'll normally find for the vast majority of videos is like this, you kind of get a, a general S shape that tapers off at the beginning, hopefully gets relatively flat in the middle, and then tapers off again at the end. And I would start judging the uh, quality of the content at each point in this funnel, um, like at each point in the graph, slightly differently. So let's look at the nose to start with. So the first two to 5%, let's say. Um, what we tend to find is that the average engagement loss just goes up quite linearly here. Um, so the longer the video, you know, obviously, the, the more people tend to drop off in that first 2%. Um, and the way to basically try and improve this is to get people's attention as soon as they start. So disrupt expectations, create intrigue, do something interesting. What you don't want to do is start the video with like a you know, branded ident or a sting or a, hi, I'm Phil, and today I'm going to talk to you about like, all of that has to go. You basically just want to start with the point and get people engaged straight away. In fact, the way which I would recommend thinking about this is kind of like every video you work with has a skip ad button. Now, obviously, if you're doing YouTube pre-roll advertising, every video does have a skip ad button. But I think actually this principle applies no matter what video you're working with. Let's take Facebook for an example. Uh, here is a Facebook video. Uh, here it comes, ready, gone. So you had like kind of two to three seconds max to engage somebody as they're scrolling past your general stuff on Facebook. Um, and I think this is a general principle you need to take into account with all videos. You have to capture attention immediately. And that's going to be how you, you know, get the highest engagement in the nose. Um, how about then when we look at the body? So we see that the average engagement loss here uh, kind of actually peaks up a little bit at that point, which suggests that um, basically if you're creating a video that's about one to two minutes in length, that's when you're going to usually retain people for the longest period of time. And obviously the, the really, really long videos are going to see much higher drop off in the body, which kind of stands to reason. But it doesn't necessarily mean that longer videos are worse, because if somebody watches five minutes of a whole video or five minutes, which just is half a video, that's still five minutes of video. And so the way to improve this, I think, is, is often with chunking. So much like you would look at segmenting a website visually and having little bits here and there, um, you can chunk uh, videos into sections in the same way by having little icons and markers that show you how far you're into it. Uh, you can think about using lots of B-roll to add that visual dynamism, so lots of different kinds of shots rather than just keeping it on a single shot at all the time. Uh, obviously, add lots of personality. The more engaging, the dynamic, uh, the video is going to be more engaging. And particularly, think very carefully about the music you're using. Um, you want music to be understated, but keep that rhythm and keep people engaged and punching all the way through the video. What you don't want is just a kind of general lacrimose sort of uh, dirge that sort of sits throughout because that's going to just turn people off and make them feel lethargic. And then lastly, how about the tail? So the tail in the last few percent of the video, what we see interestingly here is that videos that are about 10 to 20 percent uh, tend to see the uh, 10 to 20 10 to 20 minutes long tend to see the biggest drop-off in the tail. And actually, if you get really, really long videos, so you're creating a video that's over 10 minutes, people are actually almost always likely to stay right to the end. So I think it's that sunk cost fallacy of investing all that time in watching a video you're going to get all the way through. How can we improve this? Well, you need to be aware of that peak end rule, particularly with video. So you want to end on a high, essentially. And if you're trying to drive people further in that funnel, uh, ending on a high is incredibly important because you want them to feel engaged and inspired to go and do new things. So don't think about wrapping up. Just end on a high. Uh, keep any logos or titles short and make sure that your ending music uh, you know, ends on that peak as well. So a big crescendo and cadence rather than just sort of tailing off into the middle of nowhere. So when it comes to evaluating engagement overall for all of your videos, um, here is just some rules of thumb that I think you can take away and, and give to your clients or to your customers. Uh, that if you see a greater than 30% drop off in the nose, it's probably because there isn't a clear hook. If you see a greater than 50% drop off in the body, unfortunately, that just means your content sucks and you should probably create something else. And if you see a greater than 30% drop off in the tail, that's because you really haven't got a compelling call to action or, or an, an ending to the video that's engaging. 
So that's how you can kind of split test content. Just want to finish for the last few minutes talking about in-stream actions. So in-stream actions are basically things like turnstiles, so email gates, annotations, and calls to action. I'll run through each quite quickly. So firstly, turnstiles. Um, so this is a turnstile. It's just an email gate that you can have on a video. Uh, you can place this anywhere in the, uh, in the timeline of the video itself. You can also add other elements if you want to get phone numbers, names, addresses, etc. cetera. Um, and here is what we see. So the average conversion rate uh, over the video length for a turnstile shows that actually the longer the video, the more likely somebody is to want to put in their email in order to watch it. And I think this stands to reason because ultimately if you're going to be giving your email and you want value in return, you kind of want a long video that seems valuable in order to do this. And so generally if you're trying to do lead gen, if you're trying to do email capture with video, I'd recommend doing this kind of content. So lectures, webinars, courses, interviews, workshops, essentially long form learning content. And at Wistia, we've had real success with this recently, doing some very, very simple things, which is just this. We have set up a, a laptop and a second monitor. We've just got a guy speaking, and he just delivers a lecture that he may do at a conference or an internal workshop or whatever. And we film this with a bunch of um, you know, B-roll and basically just take, shots of, take screenshots of the slides themselves, string this all together, and create half an hour sort of learning content that people have to put their email in to get. So we've done one on like DSLR basics, that kind of thing. And the way in which you can scale these up effectively is actually by thinking of long form content. It doesn't have to be one take. I think we get into this habit thinking about webinars and conference presentations that it's basically one long take and we have to somehow perform for half an hour. And obviously that's extremely difficult to do in front of a camera. But if you are thinking about chunking that up with B-roll or slides that can come in the middle, you can actually just record each uh, section independently and then string it all together at the end, which obviously takes the pressure off your performers if you're working with people that aren't particularly experienced in front of camera. But what about turnstile locations? So you can put the turnstile essentially anywhere in your video playback. You can put it at the start, so a pre-roll gate. You can put it at the end, uh, like a, a post-roll call to action, or you can put it somewhere in the middle. Um, and we found that most customers, so of, the, of all the different people using turnstiles, there's about a million videos. Um, about 50% are putting it right at the end, the post-roll. 25% um, at the start, and 26% somewhere in the middle. However, here's the kicker, an interesting thing. This is the conversion rates. If you put it at the end, the average conversion rate tends to be 3.4%. If you put it at the start, it's about 16%, but in the middle, it's actually 24%. So what we've noticed, and, and here's how it breaks down in a more granular way, what we've noticed is actually putting a turnstile in the middle, having a mid-roll email gate is much, much more effective as a rule of thumb than having a pre-roll or a post-roll one. And the reason why I think this works is that um, it's the kind of sunk cost thing. So once you've actually uh, put a great deal of time and effort into watching a particular video, if you've watched two minutes of it, you're more inclined to give your email and then want to watch the rest because you've invested that existing time. And so what I'd recommend is doing this long form learning content, creating just a video that has a kind of two, three minute introduction, then putting in this interesting email gate here, actually about 20% of the way through the video because the average conversion rate there is 43%, which is really, really high. Um, so putting it there and then allowing people to watch the rest of the video is the reward for giving you that lead. Really, really nice hack, just before I finish off. Um, this also works on Twitter. Uh, if you use a, a video on Twitter and you embed a turnstile, um, you can actually use Twitter as a lead gen tool. So put some promoted spend behind Twitter, um, have these you know, gated emails, and then you can start not just using Twitter for brand awareness and clicks, but also for leads as well. So anyone in B2B, really, really nice uh, tactic there that can get some really, really good return from um, Twitter spend. Uh, okay, lastly, annotations. So annotations, these kind of things that you see on videos, you obviously get them on YouTube, you can do them on Wister, et cetera. Uh, I wanted to quickly test what the um, average click-through rate was based on the, uh, the wording. So the classic CRO test, but let's apply it to annotations. Uh, here's what we get. If we don't include the word click, uh, there's an average click-through rate of about 1%. Click, 2.7, and click here, 3.9. So unfortunately, people just aren't quite used to the idea of clicking on a video, so you have to tell them to do it. Uh, and lastly, calls to action. So these are basically full screen post-roll links as well. Same kind of thing is true. However, click here doesn't seem to be quite as important. Uh, just including the word click somewhere in the message, so it might be click to discover more about our fantastic product, et cetera, seems to work. Um, and also, interestingly, for calls to action, if you're trying to drive next action, so for example, a product video that has, uh, you know, encouraging people to click to a new page to find out more details, a video that's shorter than a minute tends to get a much higher click-through rate than those that are long. So basically, 
the learning here is if you're trying to do lead gen, do really long form half an hour videos and put a post roll email, uh, mid roll email gate. But if you're doing a product video, keep it under a minute long. Last, last tip, video and email. So we have an email uh, list of about 200,000 people and I wanted to split test a few times and see uh, how including a, an image like this uh, would compare, so a, a video thumbnail would compare to just having a static image in an email in terms of click through rate. And the findings were pretty compelling. We saw three times more people click through to watch a video than when you put an image. So this is obviously really simple to do because all you have to do is just include a little play button on the image itself and people are more likely to click through from doing this. So to summarize, uh, split test everything, obviously. We're optimizers. Um, in terms of the quality of video, authentic tends to outweigh professional. So don't worry about having stuff that's really too well produced. Just care about doing things that are authentic and exciting and really sell uh, who you are as a business. Uh, embed the video high up on the page because uh, you're going to get a higher play rate. Uh, embed at a 460, uh, 400 to 600 pixels wide uh, frame because that's going to give you the highest play rate. Match the player to the brand colors. Uh, create a movie poster style thumbnail. Uh, optimize the content for attention by looking at that nose, the body, and the tail, and trying to make sure you keep as many people throughout. Uh, use that long form learning for uh, lead gen if you're trying to get email addresses. Uh, include the turn style about 20% of the way through the video to optimize for that. If you're doing annotations, the language needs to include click here. If you're doing calls to action, the language needs to include click. And use the video thumbnails in email as well. Uh, I hope that was very useful.